Revenge does wonders for the will to live, don't you think? There are some things far more frightening than death. It means you are what I once was. What's up, Meta Nerds? Welcome back to part two. Previously, we followed the Grand Inquisitor from birth, temple life, fall to the dark side, and nine years of leading the Inquisitorius. In 9 BBY, the GI would lead the search for the Jedi tracked to Tatooine, arriving via the Scythe, the Inquisitorius' personal transport ship. He sat down with the fifth brother and third sister, heading straight for the cantina owned by a man reported to be aided by an Order 66 survivor. Combining terror and theatrics, he hoped to make sure that word of this incident spread throughout the planet, and forced the Jedi to act. Third sister didn't have much patience, and throwing a knife at the owner's head, it is stopped by the Force, revealing their target. He stood calmly and let the brother and sister corner the man, but again the sister's impatience threatened to rob them of this capture. He stopped her blade from slicing the man in two, burning through cloth and skin. He tosses her aside, and then moves to rebuke her. You will forget this fixation with Kenobi, or I will relieve you of your duties, is that clear? Relieving of duty would likely mean death, or something worse. He had learned years ago that he would have to maintain a absolute respect for the chain of command, missing out on several high-profile captures because the Emperor or Vader directed him to a certain task. And though he did not know that one of those near misses was Ahsoka Tano, he did know that the three biggest prey out there on Vader's personal list, the ones he wanted to cut down personally, were Yoda, Ahsoka, and Kenobi. The following day, he hoped that the fifth brother could keep her in check as they continued the hunt for the Jedi Nari. Perhaps the dark side guided her to the perfect target, holding the blade to Owen's neck, threatening to kill his family if the crowd wouldn't provide intel. It is unclear if Kenobi would have intervened, and her methods are more reckless and brutal than even the Inquisitors wanted, pushing the fifth brother into a rage, but she was focused on killing Anakin Skywalker's old master, proving herself and rising to the position of the Grand Inquisitor. As a youngling, she looked into Anakin's face as he slaughtered her friends and left her for dead. She was one of the few in the galaxy to know Darth Vader's true identity, and maybe why she is both so twisted and not pre previously seen at work in the Inquisitorious. Her lower number of third sister means she should have been one of the earlier Inquisitors, but perhaps Vader or Sidious were directly involved in her torture, waiting to see if she had to be killed to keep this secret, or if this knowledge, trauma, and survivor guilt could be forged into an intense Stockholm Syndrome, an absolute loyalty even greater than the Powans. In her tenacity, she devises a brazen plot to kidnap Princess Leia Organa, correctly expecting that the desperate Bail Organa would call in his old Jedi friend. When the GI learns of this, he is very displeased. Whatever power you are craving, it will not change what you are. He knew Vader wanted to be the one to capture Kenobi, and though assumed to be off-limits, he certainly wasn't going to allow the sewer rat beneath him to bring in the once master of his master. Moving to rapidly scramble a garrison on this world, Deyu, he reminds the fifth brother of the importance of this target. Kenobi is the last ember of a dying age. They and the fourth sister would take stormtroopers and spread throughout the grimy streets, and bounty hunters got involved too. Another subversion of her master, the third sister was truly betting it all on this hunt, and when she did find Kenobi, he would make sure that the fruits of this foolish and disrespectful act were given to her betters. Third sister! I can stand the reek of your ambition no longer! And picking up on Obi-Wan's presence, he ordered her to step aside, and went to force open a path, only to have his underling go from ambitious to treacherous. <laughs> Really think I'd let you take all the credit? As he folded and fell to the floor, Third Sister tried and failed to stop Kenobi. What none of the Inquisitors knew was that their leader had been whisked away and healed, likely with a combination of back to tank and array of medical droids. Vader would inflame the competition amongst them to take the title of Grand, all focused on motivating them to finally bring Kenobi in. Probe droids on Mapuzo would pick up Kenobi, and the full force of the Empire descended here, including Darth Vader, who would get to face off against his old master after nine years of burning rage, while the third sister discovered a secret complex that made up part of the path the system for concealing Jedi survivors, assigning them new identities, and relocating them across the stars. Though Kenobi did escape, Third Sister captured Leia, and the princess was moved to their semi-submerged fortress on Nur. The Grand Inquisitor was likely within this complex somewhere receiving medical treatment, while Kenobi and rebel allies were able to break Leia out. This embarrassing defeat would spark Vader's rage. You were born what defeat would bring. 
But when she explains that this was part of her plan, that Leia's droid had a tracker that would now bring them to the main location on the path, they could now snuff out the entire traitorous network. For this, she would be given the title of Grand Inquisitor on the bridge of Vader's personal Star Destroyer, the Devastator. Moments later, they would emerge from hyperspace over the final destination in the Jedi Path, the Outer Rim world of Jabim. The siege would see many stormtroopers and traitors die, but when Kenobi let himself be captured, he succeeded in clearing the Third Sister's mind to see her true enemy, and she sent the Clone Wars hero back inside the hidden hangar complex, pulling off an escape that would require Vader's near-complete focus to try and prevent, giving Reva the perfect chance to strike. He was wise to use you against me. The battle would take full advantage of her aggression and overconfidence, making her think she had disarmed a Dark Lord of the Sith, only to grab her blade, summon his own, and walk her down to her demise. Their minds flashed back to that night in the temple, and the true Grand Inquisitor returned. Revenge does wonders for the will to live, don't you think? Kneeling down to explain how they used her rage to track Kenobi, but now she would be left to die again. Though the rebellious group escaped, the Devastator was in pursuit, and after their shuttle rejoined them, the Grand Inquisitor tried his best to respect his master, and yet try to get him to focus on shutting down the rebel group and network, instead of focusing on the individual, Kenobi. When a small ship jettisoned away from the main freighter, Vader knew this was his old master, and nothing in the galaxy was more important. We cannot prioritize one lone Jedi. Though all the details of his master's long-awaited battle with Kenobi were surely withheld, and Reva's redemption on Tatooine was not known to the Empire, what was clear was that Kenobi survived, and the unholy union of traitorous Jedi and rebellious citizens was only growing stronger with the years. And four years later, in 5 BBY, Lord Vader informed him that their Sith master wanted to take the Inquisitorius in a new direction. The Emperor has foreseen a new threat rising against him. The Children of the Force. So few Order 66 survivors remained that their impact would be nil, or they were already caught up in rebel movements and would be picked up in the military efforts against the General Rebellion. The Inquisitorius would embark on the never-ending fight against the Force itself. The Force would grant its gifts seemingly at random, and the light would always guide those in ways at odds to Sidious's empire. That perpetual flame of the Jedi that had gone unextinguished for thousands of years was all but completely gone. But now they had to be diligent against those bolts of lightning in the wilderness, snuffing out these new flames, the children born after Order 66. Guided by random intervention by the Force, those who might still be led to the Jedi path. Project Harvester's search for Force-sensitive children was now incorporated in the military academies, in the forms of tests and observations made by the officers throughout academies for young Imperials. At least one was found on Lothal, and since this planet had a low population and was not as deeply under Imperial control, there had to be thousands of candidates detected, all set to undergo the tortures that would either kill them or turn them into tools for the dark side, either as Inquisitors or those trance-like, mindless Force-detecting beacons that would be used to detect other children, dragging them to the same fate. During a mission to Lothal, the Spectre's rebel group picked up an orphan named Ezra Bridger, and when they were nearly captured trying to free the Wookiee slaves on Kessel, Kanan Jarrus resorted to using his lightsaber to escape. Imperial Security Bureau agent Alexander Callis, like all ISB agents, knew who to contact when an Order 66 survivor had been detected, and he knew the difference between someone who was using a lightsaber and someone who had been properly trained with it as a Jedi. The leader of that cell made good use a lightsaber. By now, 14 years into the Imperial Age, the tools at the Emperor's disposal were immense and battle-tested. From pure destruction to psyops and double-cross, the rebels were constantly being beaten from all angles. One of the more nuanced tactics was to be used to bring in this Jedi, later to be known as Kanan Jarrus. To draw him out, they would have Gal Travis, a man that faked dissenting against the Empire, stepping down from the Imperial Senate and going into exile. In reality, he was sending all his conversations with disgruntled Imperials to outright rebel terrorists. All of it went straight to the Empire, but it was also a great way to provide the Rebellion with false information. By combining this asset with advanced hollows, they made it seem like the powerful Jedi Master Luminara Unduli was alive, and imprisoned at the Spire on Stygian Prime. This prison was known throughout the Rebel networks as being impenetrable, but Kanan knew this may be their last chance to save someone with her level of power in the Force. For all he knew, she may be the only surviving Jedi Master in the galaxy. And just when it seemed their bravery and planning had worked, the Grand Inquisitor took great joy in seeing hope fade from his target's eyes as he introduced himself. I am the Inquisitor. Welcome. 
This tactic embodied the power of the dark side, using the Jedi's heroics and hopefulness to draw several of them into capture, using dead Jedi as bait to kill more Jedi. Like Project Harvester, using corrupted children to capture more children, the way the dark side exponentiated its power surely proved it was stronger than the light, and soon all of existence would be under its rule. And the G.I. felt this flow through him as he engaged this man, picking up on a quirk in his fight style. It seems you trained with Jedi Master Depa Bilaba. How? And in this snowballing effect, he hopes to kill Kanan and convert the boy. This presumed Padawan could be made an apprentice to the dark side. Your master cannot save you, boy. He is unfocused and undisciplined. Then we're perfect for each other! Fearing that he would lose Ezra, this child of the Force, Kanan is able to generate a powerful blast that would free them, and worst of all, show the Padawan how powerful the light could be. Something that strengthened the Lightsider's bond, and helped them pull off an unthinkable escape. Soon after this, he would be contacted by Commandant Oresco, with news that could provide the G.I. with some new prey. We've identified two cadets, Morgan and Kel, that meet your special criteria. But the Spectres were already infiltrating this academy with hopes of gaining access to Agent Callus' office, specifically looking for his decoder, the device containing the location on a powerful kyber crystal, which unbeknownst to them was set to be used in the Death Star program. Ezra would take the name Morgan, and his two squad mates were Zari Leonis and Jai Kel. Leonis joined to find out what really happened to his sister, who was that girl taken from this academy years earlier, with the Empire reporting that she simply ran away. When the Spectre's plan was launched, the potentially Force-sensitive Kel and Ezra escaped, but Leonis wanted to stay and find his sister, making it seem like he had tried to stop his friends. Blasting away as they raced off, he would be rewarded by meeting with the man that oversaw his sister's torture. Let's take a walk, shall we? I want to know everything about your former friends. And in this conversation, Leonis claims that he was Force-sensitive, that he could sense something in the other cadets, and could somehow detect his lost sister. Instead of taking him to the Fortress Inquisitorius right then, the G.I. cryptically says that he would understand this sense more in the future. Imperial networks then track Kanan Jarrus to the planet Vindal. A man called Yeleb the Protector steps forward to tell the Palawan to leave in peace that he had not seen a Jedi, but the Force betrays him. Seeing the man's thoughts, he orders his stormtroopers to level the city, pulling Jarrus out of hiding. Sabers crashed, but to his surprise, Yelub also produced a saber and rushed into the fight. This man was not a Jedi, rather he scooped up the lightsaber from the wreckage of Aneta II with the dead Jedi inside. A Force push sent Jarrus away, giving him an opening to cut the Jedi Pretender down. Taking his saber, he then turned to Jarrus, who was now fleeing from the Imperial Force. They were led to believe that the Jedi escaped by sneaking into one of their own cruisers, and they quickly scrambled back to their second ship to track him. With the Imperials pulled away, Jarrus made it back to the Protector, who would succumb to his wounds. For some time now, he had been using an experimental TIE Fighter variant called the TIE Advanced V-1, part of the same program that involved the Advanced X-1 used by Vader. Lothal had a major Sinar Fleet Systems facility, and the new V-1 was set to be debuted to the public during the Empire Day celebrations, the day that marked the end of the Republic and Clone Wars. The Grand Inquisitor and Agent Callus were here to track the traitor Sibo, a Rodian outfitted with a cyborg construct that possessed invaluable Imperial intel on schematics, tactics, and communications. They must be punished! We all want that, Minister. But our priority is still the Rodian. When Callus confirms that the Spectre's group is fleeing with the Rodian, the GI scrambles his V-1 with a squadron of ties under his command. The incredible speed of these fighters allowed him to get into position behind the Ghost and land shots that shock Chopper, disabling the droid. As they make it into space, another four ties join them, while many fighters were destroyed by the Ghost's powerful turrets. The GI makes sure to utilize his craft's variable launcher, putting a tracker on the Spectre's ship. Even though their impressive pilot was able to slice between two Star Destroyers and jump to hyperspace, he was still confident in the plan, and even had a deeper way to track them. We are receiving a signal from the tracker. They will not be able to outrun us for long. I still sense the Jedi and his Padawan within my grasp. Kanan Jarrus explains this to Ezra, that it isn't just the tracker now, but with all these close calls, they could detect each other's presence in the Force. Because there's more than a tracker at work here. Back on Lothal, I sensed it. The Inquisitor is on our trail, and as long as Ezra and I are on board the Ghost, 
were jeopardizing Sibo's escape. The Jedi launch a dangerous plan to drop out of hyperspace without all the tech implemented to guarantee safety, but just separating the shuttle of the Phantom to naturally decelerate and drop out into real space. His plan worked, and killed two birds with one stone as the tracker had attached to the shuttle, not the main vessel prompting Admiral Constantine to stutter as the Darksider was so focused on his Force connection that while true, the targets were also being tracked via normal technology. I sense movement in the Force. Uh, yes. The tracker indicates the Rebel ship has emerged from hyperspace. As his Star Destroyer loomed over the old Clone Wars era Republic HQ world of Anaxis, he descends via Lambda Shuttle with a complement of stormtroopers. When he sees the Jedi dug in, hoping the Minox would spring on the Imperial forces and devour them, he laughs at this silly scheme. This was your plan. <laughs> <laughs> With more than a decade of active combat hunting all sorts of enemies of the state, he outmaneuvers Kanan's saber with ease, prompting the Jedi to resort to a sidearm, truly a sign of the ragged, uncivilized state of these once great warriors. Still, it was futile, and with a push, the man is knocked unconscious and his saber is picked up by Ezra, only to be effortlessly ripped out of his hands. Your devotion to your master is admirable, but it will not save you. Nothing. And this terrifying sight was the dark side's greatest ally. This one could make for a great inquisitor. I will teach you what your master could not. Void a natural strength in connecting with animals, and used his anger to connect with the dark side to control the mother Frynok, using it as a weapon. The GI made the spinning red saber act as a shield and Kanan's blue blade to strike, and he was able to keep it back until the beast saw an opening and knocked the Jedi saber free. It would take his complete focus to stay alive, giving the Jedi a chance to escape, but he scared off the beast just in time to launch a spinning blade towards Master and Padawan, only to be harmlessly deflected at the last second, adding to an unprecedented string of losses. My master would not be pleased. Following this failure, he turned to his suspicious lead on Lothal, the cadet Leonis. He wanted the boy moved to the Arcanus Academy, a spot where, if he was secretly a rebel ally, the boy would surely be tempted by the greater access to Imperial secrets, or if the rebels tried to rescue him, there would be a greater chance they would be caught. Of course, this was made to look like a promotion, and after some time here, the boy tried to infiltrate an area that was off-limits, a tower which contained areas for Project Harvester and for Project Unity, the latter being the civilian or non-force-wielding sister program, which would take dissidents and use torture methods to turn them into trusted Imperial assets. The GI was having dinner with Commandant Brendel Hux, the father of Armitage Hux, who would rise to high status in the First Order. And when they finished, he summoned the boy to the Commandant's balcony to probe his mind for answers on the connection to the Spectres. In his questioning about the boy's presence in restricted areas, he could tell the cadet was lying, and made sure to warn him that the rebel group would soon be captured, along with any traitorous allies they had within the Empire. From here, he would meet with another Imperial that would play a major role in the First Order, Ray Sloan. She had fought against Kanan Jarrus years earlier on the planet Gorse, during the mission where Captain Harris and Dula would first meet Kanan. She had risen to the rank of Vice Admiral, but in her speech about how she tracked him down, Kanan waited for the chance to force Blaster into the wall. When she regained consciousness, she found that her target had escaped. All these years of planning were for nothing. And furious, she initially dismisses the voice calling to her, only to see that it was the Emperor's Grand Inquisitor, that he was eager to hear all about her hobby, what this six years of intensive research had dug up on the mysterious Jedi with the alias Kanan Jarrus. Meanwhile, his presence in the Force was still having an effect on Ezra Bridger. When his master took him to the hidden Jedi Temple on Lothal, the boy was plagued with nightmarish visions of the Grand Inquisitor slaughtering his new rebel family. When the Padawan overcame his fear, the horror dissolved. When he returned to Lothal, he was informed that Governor Tarkin would be paying them a visit. The Clone Wars veteran was no friend of the Jedi, was a near lifelong friend of Palpatine's, and had a rank more on par with Vader, above even the Grand Inquisitor, as Palpatine's right hand not in matters of the Force, but instead the entire military, and was lead of the secret superweapon project whispered about throughout High Command. Tarkin was one of three people in the galaxy that could speak to them like this. A shame we don't have someone who specializes in dealing with them, otherwise our problem might be solved. Later, Tarkin would summon Commandant Oresco and Taskmaster Gint to explain their string of failures to the same rebel cell. And the Grand Inquisitor was happy to show his ruthlessness and dedication to snuffing out this threat. <laughs> That evening, Callus would return with probe footage of the rebels heading towards an important communications tower. I want this Jedi alive. Your faith will be rewarded. The 
The battle would force the Spectres to alter their plans on the fly, and Kanan knew the only hope his crew had would be if he stayed back to hold the Imperials off. As Callus had him surrounded, the Inquisitor dropped in, and when the Jedi rushes, he is surprised at what he sees. You've been practicing. Nice of you to notice. He explains that if he surrenders, his eager Imperial master may let his friends live. Unexpectedly, the Jedi deactivates his blade, but when the ghost came in blasting, the fight was back on, and the rage erupts in him, meeting his blade, pushing him against the wall, and then outmaneuvering his attacks to disarm and pin the Jedi scum. The rebel yells at his friends to leave him, and in the dawn, the Grand Inquisitor could finally present his long-awaited capture, a shackled Jedi on his knees behind him as he proudly greeted Tarkin. They would transport the prisoner to Tarkin's flagship, the Sovereign. In orbit over Lothal, Kanan would be restrained and prepped for torture. He explains to Tarkin that while mind probes may not work, Jedi can be broken through pain, just like everyone else. After the initial search failed, Jarus gets his first volley of electric shock. I take it you have a solution? Pain. A Jedi still feels pain. The Inquisitor wonders if these rebel cells are really so separated that Kanan doesn't know of the other groups, but Tarkin says to be sure they should transfer him to the facility that never fails. The Spectres had been able to track the ship's movements and are devastated at the plotted coordinates. The Mustafar system? I've never heard of it. He said Mustafar is where Jedi go to die. When they pop out of hyperspace, he's demanding the identity of one codename Fulcrum. This mysterious signal had been connected to several different rebel groups, and he would never learn that this was Skywalker's old apprentice. Jarrus showed no signs of weakness, so he took the conversation to the night of Order 66, to the death of his master, Depa Balaba. Quote her final words. You'll hear her voice when you wake. Tell me, Jedi, what was her last word to you? Run and he pressed into this wound, wondering if the Spectres knew he was a coward, who ran, who let his master die, who hid in the streets, abandoning his Jedi identity. Using a stolen Gazanti and landing codes, the Rebels sent in a TIE fighter packed full of EMP detonators that rippled through Hangar 5 and much of the Sovereign systems, forcing Tarkin's crew to switch to auxiliary power. While the Spectres worked their way through the Star Destroyer, the Grand Inquisitor hoped to use the Master as bait for the Padawan. Knowing they would move to the reactor, he was there waiting for them igniting his saber as Kanan took his Padawan's unique blade, a creation that was fit for the times, with a blaster packed into the hilt. He was surprised by the Jedi switching from guard to blasting, something that would have never been seen in the temple training sessions, and did show Kanan growing away from his strict adherence to his master style. But the dark side was flowing through him. He easily parries and gets himself between master and Padawan, but the quick-thinking boy rips Kanan's blade into his hands. At last, a fight that might be worthy of my time. Igniting his second Crimson Saber, he keeps them at bay, incorporating the spin feature for quick parries and to intimidate the younger Padawan, before showing the boy how the dark side can overpower the light with sheer will, flinging him away before landing several kicks and doing the same to his master. As Ezra tried to regain his footing, he was met with the powerful spinning blade launched towards his head, that even though deflected, the momentum knocked him off the walkway. Kanan looked on helpless as he believed his Padawan just fell to his death a death he was responsible for, being the one that decided to train him as a Jedi. That was a mistake. Why? Because you have no one left to die for you. No, because I have nothing left to fear. With his own saber brought back to his hand, the Grand Inquisitor smirks and makes a nod of a formal Jedi sparring session. Kanan is fighting with more intensity than any of his previous targets, and combines methods not found in any of the traditional styles or archives, along with expert use of his Padawan's blade blaster. This feeling was something he had never experienced, as he moved behind a command terminal to provide cover and hopefully slow the barrage, before another series of blows and blaster bolts push him to the edge, nearly losing his footing. The Jedi pauses his advance only to explain how connected with the Force he had become. But now I know there's something stronger than fear. Far stronger. The Force. And now the one who would strike fear into countless victims for the past 14 years, tortured Jedi to their death, and caused others to experience the horrors of the dark side. The Grand Inquisitor was now consumed by fear of the light. Desperately hiding behind his spinning blade, only to have Kanan pull the same move Vader had done that fateful day in the temple archives, splitting his blade from the inside out. He fell over the edge, barely hanging on with his fingertips, while his sabers fell and ignited one of the reactors. Knowing the end was near, he offers Kanan a warning. You have no idea what you've unleashed here today. There are some things far more frightening than death. Letting go, he fell to his quick, fiery death. 
knowing that even if he had tried to survive, with another Jedi escape and Tarkin losing his personal flagship, he would experience a kind of torture only a true Sith could provide, examined and torn apart by Vader, Sidious, or both of them. And he knew that with his death, Darth Vader would be getting personally involved in the capture of this Jedi, who had done more damage to the Empire than anyone since Kenobi. To add insult to death, the Jedi would steal his TIE V-1 to escape, and Kanan would be brought deeper into Rebel Command, learning that there were other Rebel cells, and meeting their leaders Bail Organa and Ahsoka Tano, while Lord Vader accompanied Tarkin to Lothal in order to plot how the Empire would strike back. Two years later, in 3 BBY, Kanan, Ezra, and Ahsoka went to the Lothal Jedi Temple to meditate with hopes of getting in contact with Yoda again. This temple acted as a mysterious connector with consciousness in the Force, and each would receive their own visions here. Kanan's brought him into a dojo in the Jedi Temple, where a temple guard informed him that he must stand aside and allow Ezra to be killed before his inevitable fall to the dark side. He fought well, but was overwhelmed by the trio of guards that closed in on him. And once Kanan admitted he couldn't protect him forever or from every threat, a Jedi Master could only do everything in his ability and trust the Force, not operate out of fear of the dark side. With this, instead of striking him down, the Temple Guard knights him. By the right of the Council, by the will of the Force, Kanan Jarrus, you may rise. Kanan was a Padawan during Order 66, and always felt lost and like an imposter. Now the spirit of the man who had hunted him, threatened to kill his friends and his own Padawan, had just taught him to be confident that he was a true Jedi. And Kanan knew that a Temple Guard was one of the most prestigious and high-ranking Jedi of them all. Clearly, Kanan should not be focused on titles and status. It means you are what I once was, a Knight of the Jedi Order. The dark side yellow eyes return to the Powan's natural clear gray. The Temple Guard urges him to go, that he would fight off the Inquisitors that were now forcing their way into the Lothal Temple. As the fifth brother and seventh sister step into the main chamber, they are stricken with the same terror at the power of the light that he had felt before his death. Run the Inquisitors. And they are consumed with a blinding light, but they are not killed though shaken and confused when Vader comes to see their failure. And learning that his own servant may be working as an agent of light, Vader turned to some of the most ancient and diabolical rituals ever produced in Sith history, perhaps with the aid of old Republic-era holocrons, and or his master Darth Sidious's power in Sith alchemy. The spirit of the Grand Master was forced into obedience to the dark side, and trapped in a remote Jedi temple on the outer rim world of Tempes. Vader's slave would be locked in the moment of his death, perpetually engulfed in the flames that consumed his flesh. When Luke Skywalker arrived here in 3 ABY, he picked up a Temple Guard blade, a trap that awakened the captured spirit, a dark side practice not seen since the ancient temples of Korriban. Though the spirit was bound and corrupted, he was still sentient enough to explain his past and wonder about his future. Presumably, he would spend eternity slaying all Jedi who fell for this trap. Vader must have explained this tragic fate as ironic, since the genius Powan was so successful at using Luminara and Dooley's corpse as a trap for so many years, an act that helped solidify his title of Grand Inquisitor. His rage grew as the boy showed sloppy saber technique. Igniting his second blade, he saw fear grow in Luke's eyes, beating him down only for Skywalker to force blast away some of his spirit body, pushing further the flames dissolving him into the Force once again. When Vader arrives, he again manifests, desperately explaining to his master that this one was too strong, before pleading for release from this hell. Without even looking back at his slave, Vader coldly explains that he was a tool crafted to serve him, and he would continue doing so. As he stared off, the tormented soul thought of the warning he gave to Kanan, the fate he hoped to avoid the endless flames of a trapped spirit in servitude to a Sith Lord. As he dissolved back into his hell, his warning was to no one, now just a statement of his timeless, torturous existence, that there are worse things than death. That concludes the complete life of the Grand Inquisitor. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out our sponsor, Upside. Upside is a cashback app that enables people to get more value for their purchases and improve the profitability of local businesses, helping communities grow stronger. Already, they've partnered with 30,000 businesses and 25,000 gas stations across 48 states and D.C. 
it is real cash back. Finally, someone has made it straightforward and simplified. Not the annoying points, miles, or loyalty reward conversions like some credit cards. You just cash out whenever you want and get it rewarded back to your bank account. The way it works is you check in on the app, use the card at a gas station, restaurant, or grocery store, and you'll see your cash back starting to stack up. What's funny is it works with any card payment you want. So while Upside users are earning three times cash back compared to those credit card cash back programs, you can still use that card you've been using and simply by checking in and using Upside, you can get two cash back systems going. I just pull it up, search the area, and see a full list of locations with all kinds of great options. For me, the most regular and rewarding stops have been the gas stations, which I'm sure will help a bunch of you out there. To get started, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play. Use my promo code METANERDS and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Thanks Upside for sponsoring this video. Remember, if any new material came out since this was published, I'll put links to those videos down in the description, where you can also find affiliate links with amazing discounts and free stuff, as well as our Patreon and PayPal. Likes, comments, and shares are the best way to help me out. Subscribe if you want to see more, and special thanks to our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier supporter, Oscar Jones. But most important of all, remember, never trust a Sith Lord. They never deliver on their promises, and you always end up just being a bounded servant in hell. And the force will be with you. Always.